Uh, so I'm an electronic engineer by uh, my background is electronic engineering. I noticed that the majority of the ESRs, uh, they have a pharm pharmacology background. So I tried to keep my talk very high level. Uh, so I, I hope um, the purpose is to inspire you into how we could use contact lenses for human computer interaction. So let me start by sharing the screen. Can you see my screen? Great. Yes, we can. Yes, we can, Rami. Great. So, uh, um, so my PhD candidate, who's also uh, co-supervised by by Zubair, also helped with preparing this presentation. So, all credit uh, goes to him for for his help. So, a little bit about me. So, um, uh, I run a small group at the University of Glasgow called the Engineering Education Research Group. We are uh, interested in developing and uh, adopting technologies to improve the teaching and learning of engineering curricula. Um, I actually wanted to pick up on what Anne mentioned earlier regarding uh, patenting and logbooks. Uh, I used to work uh, for a company, uh, I used to work for IBM in Switzerland, uh, IBM Research in, in Zurich, and I was constantly grilled about keeping and maintaining a logbook. Uh, unfortunately, students nowadays, they don't really do a good job in keeping those log, log books. Um, perhaps it's because we don't teach them how to keep it and, and maintaining it. Um, anyway, the reason why I wanted to bring this up is that we investigated the effectiveness of electronic laboratory notebooks. So if this is something that uh, you might wish to consider in the future, I'd be happy to talk to you uh, a little bit more uh, about it later on. Anyway. Um, for the purpose of today's talk, what I wanted to talk to you about was the use of contact lenses, which are wearable devices, and how these can be used to interact with other devices or humans. Uh, so in my group, we are interested in developing smart, intelligent, and interactive technologies that enable people to perform tasks uh, efficiently using computers. Uh, in fact, I believe that future computers will be based on technology classes that fit on the head or wrist. So if you are interested in working in these areas, please do uh, get in touch. And this is my email address if you are interested in, in working uh, with me in this area. So if we look at the trends in computation, I think certainly from the images we've all seen, I believe we can all agree that we've come a very long way since the days of large mainframe computers that used to fit into entire rooms. Uh, I, in fact, uh, thanks to advances in nano and macro, micro fabrication, computers are now so powerful that a smartphone has more computing power than all of NASA did when it put the first man on the moon uh, in the late 60s. So the extraordinary advances uh, that technology has made over time, they've raised hopes that uh, devices that are worn on or even implanted within the body uh, can become even more uh, capable. Um, I'm sure you've all come across uh, uh, Walt Whitman's poem. So this is an American poet um, where he praised the human body by saying, to be surrounded by beautiful, curious, breathing, laughing flesh is enough. So basically in that poem, despite the fact that it was written 150 years, years ago, the poem is uh, talking about the, the wonders of the human body and um, how uh, people can connect with each other. So nowadays, thanks to these wearable devices, we are slowly seeing that uh, we are able to connect better with, the, with people via these electronic devices. And for that reason, we are seeing more and more electronic devices that can be worn on or implanted in the human body. And there is this trend in computation that we are seeing uh, um, uh, it's moving towards that direction. So what is a wearable device? If we look closely at, wear at wearable devices and what they consist of, some of the key building blocks uh, are the following. So we have things like a signal processing unit, a sensing unit, an energy harvesting or a, an energy storage unit, a power conditioning unit, a communications module that's responsible for communicating and, uh, uh, and, and transmitting information, and an input and output terminal or interface. Now, in our group, 
we've been mainly focusing on this green area, so the energy harvester uh, or, uh, or the energy storage module. We've also looked into the orange areas, the power conditioning, the sensing, and the signal, uh, signal processing. So I shall be touching upon some of these areas during my talk. But if we just focus on the energy uh, harvesting area, one of the reasons why we are really interested in this is because the majority of wearable and implantable devices nowadays, they still use batteries. And as you know, batteries, they have limited capacities. So this restricts their long-term use. So the last thing you want to do when, let's say you have a pacemaker uh, that's implanted inside your body or placed inside your body, is that if it runs out of battery or if it runs out of power, is to open up the patient and then replace that, uh, that battery. So that's why we are interested in our group uh, in finding ways for which these devices can harvest their own energy from the human body or from its surroundings. And I shall be touching upon some of those techniques uh, very briefly during the talk. Um, just recently, a couple of days ago, there was news that uh, a baby has died or a, a child has died as a result of swallowing a, a button battery. Um, so I just like to very quickly, uh, if I may show you a, a, a video that demonstrates what happens as a result of um, swallowing a, a, a battery. Let's mimic what can happen so when I'm a button bank of the esophagus slightly. and water, saliva, but put another battery here so we can see the chemical reaction that happens. So as you can see, a serious issue as a result of uh, uh, batteries which are hazardous as they interact with with flesh. So that is why we are trying to find alternative ways of uh, powering uh, these wearable devices. So some of the ways that we've investigated and looked into are, for example, the use of uh, solar cells, uh, the use of um, uh, these are semiconducting materials that are used in order to convert the sun's energy into useful electricity. And these have very high uh, power densities. So this is uh, particularly advantageous as uh, in wearable devices, you, are, you have a restricted amount of area. So you want to keep uh, these uh, energy conversion uh, uh, technologies as light as possible. Uh, we can also use antennas uh, and these antennas are used in order to convert radio frequency waves into electricity. We can also convert mechanical energy. So this is motion using piezoelectric materials. And here the energy density is still a little bit lower than solar energy, but it's a very useful way of converting uh, people's motions into useful electricity. We can also convert uh, the bo body temperature or body heat into useful electricity using these thermoelectric devices. So usually they are based on semiconducting materials. And as you can see, the power density again is a lot lower than uh, uh, solar energy. So we have focused quite a lot in our group on trying to find ways of converting the sun's energy into useful electricity for wearable applications. So for those of you who are not familiar with how solar cells work, so these are very simple devices uh, that involve the excitation of an electron, uh, um, uh, an electron from the valence band to the conduction band as a result of a photon having energy that is greater than the band gap of that material. Um, and uh, if uh, this uh, PN junction device is then connected to an external circuit, then we would get uh, current uh, flow. So not all of these uh, devices are, are efficient. 
uh, their, efficiency, their efficiency is typically lower than 30%. So what we try to do is we try to connect or to contact materials with different band gaps uh, so that they can absorb as much of this solar, solar spectrum as possible. And this helps us achieve a higher uh, efficiency. We've previously done this. We've demonstrated this for, in our group, we've previously demonstrated this for power plant applications. And uh, here we are demonstrating that we can connect these high efficiency uh, uh, PV cells in series and parallel in order to generate a lot of electricity. And there is no reason that we could do the same thing also for wearable applications. And this is what we are uh, currently investigating. Certainly, we've seen a lot of wearable um, uh, devices or uh, non-wearable devices now integrating solar cells, such as, for example, solar-powered jackets, uh, solar-powered bags. So what about contact lenses? Is this a possibility? So why are we interested in, in, in contact lenses and why in particular smart contact lenses? Well, we actually what inspired us to work uh, in this area was this uh, very interesting series. I'm sure most of you know it is called Black Mirror. Uh, so in the series Black Mirror, one of the episodes, it shows someone who is wearing a contact lens and they are able to project and display images. Now, as, engineer, as engineers, we asked ourselves, is this really possible? Can we really achieve a contact lens that projects or displays images uh, into our eyes? Also, we asked ourselves, what are the building blocks and components that are necessary in order to realize these lenses? So we first tried to find a definition for what a smart contact lens is. And when we searched the literature, we found that um, the agreed definition of a smart contact lens was something along the lines of it's, an elect it's, a, it's a contact lens that uses electronic components to address a complex problem. So basically, it's a, it's a combination of electronic components. Now, it's not possible for us to work on all these components, but we started to focus on particular areas, particular building blocks within this contact lens. And obviously we have, we have seen in Hollywood lots of movies uh, that again, illustrate this concept, such as for example, Minority Report and uh, Mission Impossible. Um, one of the scenes was actually very interesting because it demonstrates exactly this concept of human computer interaction, where as far as I believe, as far as I remember, uh, the wearer was using a gesture, was um, making a blinking motion in order to take an image or a photograph of, of, of a document. So why in particular our eyes? Why are we focusing on developing devices for our eyes? Well, nobody knows where the origin of this phrase comes from, um, but some attribute it to Shakespeare, others attribute it to the French poet Guillaume de Salust. Um, uh, regardless, um, uh, I think we can all agree that our eyes are widely regarded as the window or the gateway to the soul. Also, the Roman philosopher Chichiro once said, the face is a picture of the mind, whereas the eyes are its interpreter. So basically, we can obtain a wealth of information from our eyes. And so we are trying to develop devices that can enable us to obtain this information. So... Why, why our eyes? And why is it possible to obtain information, all that information from our eyes? So uh, what we've come to realize is that there are two main things that we can capture from the eyes. So first of all, there is the, we can capture eye movement. And thanks to um, the muscles that are located around the eye, there are six basic eye movements. So these are abduction, so this is moving away from the midline, adduction, moving towards the midline, sub, subreduction or elevation, so that's moving up, introduction or depression, that's moving down, encyclotorsion, as well as excyclo, excy, excyclotorsion. So these are all uh, basic movements that can be obtained as a result of um, uh, the muscles that are located around the eye. So if we are able to develop devices that can track the motion of these eyes, then there can, uh, then we can achieve this, this interaction. 
Mo moreover, we can also detect certain biomarkers from uh, tear fluid in the eyes. So, for example, uh, um, certain biomarkers can enable us to determine whether a patient is suffering from a disease or not. Uh, so by monitoring, for example, the concentration of protein, we can determine whether, uh, wh whether a person has an infection or an inflammation. Um, also by, by monitoring or by measuring uh, the, the zinc content, we can determine whether patients uh, are suffering from uh, keratitis, which is an inflammation of the eye, and so on and so forth. So by developing uh, devices, by developing sensors that can track that can measure some of these biomarkers, we can determine whether a patient is suffering from uh, any of these diseases or not. So a, a plethora of information that can be collected uh, from the eyes. So why, why contact lenses in particular? Well, and, 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 and why human-computer interaction? So human-computer interaction, this is a field that combines three uh, three other fields or three subfields, which are human factors engineering, uh, computer science, and cognitive science. So as more and more devices are connected and automatically carry out tasks in the background, operating all these devices need to be intuitive and they must not be, uh, they must not place excessive demand on the users. So there has to be smooth communication between people and these devices. And this is what human computer interaction is all about. Now, since we're dealing with uh, people that interact with these devices, these, these devices, they require an input device. So usually this input device is a touch screen device. It could be a touchpad. It could be a keyboard. So in all of these cases, these input devices require manual manipulation. So what about people with physical disabilities? How can they communicate or interact with these devices? Now, as we've just established, since our eyes are used to collect necessary visual information from these devices, we can also use them to control and interact with machines or with computers or with electronics. So we thought that we could perhaps develop hardware and software to detect eye movements and also to detect certain biomarkers from the eye. And this would be one way to facilitate this human computer interaction. So why smart contact lenses for human computer interaction? As I've mentioned, so these are non-invasive, so they are suitable for continuous, uh, um, so they are um, uh, suitable for a variety of applications. Um, we can use them to detect uh, biomarkers from uh, the human body. They can also be used for a variety of applications that include medical, gesture recognition, augmented reality, collecting bioinformation, so a plethora of, uh, of information that can be obtained from the eyes. If we look at historical developments, so I know that there's a lot of information from this slide, but maybe some of the key uh, things to notice is that this all started, uh, or the rapid developments in the use of contact lenses for uh, human-computer interaction all started off in 2010, where researchers have demonstrated how single pixels can be switched on and off wirelessly. Um, and if we look at the, the trend here, so this is the number of publications um, during the past 20 years, it is also showing that uh, this, this rapid increase in the number of publications and the interest in the use of co smart contact lenses and development of, the contact, of smart contact lenses is also strongly related to recent developments in nano and microfabrication. So here, this orange line also shows the decrease in the width of the CMOS gates. Uh, so uh, as you know, transistors are the basic building block of all electronic devices. So as these transistors are decreasing in size, we can integrate more and more transistors. And as a result, we can develop smaller and smaller uh, electronic devices. So because of microfabrication, because of our advances in microfabrication, we have now seen this increase in, in, in research 
in uh, the development of smart and electronic contact lenses. So our vision is that it is possible. So this is a, a graphic that shows the, we are projecting in the future that it would be possible to develop this, uh, this entire solution that consists of uh, solar cells that are perhaps integrated with antennae. These antennas would be responsible for communicating uh, and transmitting information as well as harvesting energy from the background uh, that can be then converted into useful electricity. We would also be able to, dis uh, to display uh, information to the user using um, uh, displays that are also integrated uh, on the contact lens. We would also be able to integrate things like a processor, which would be responsible for processing the information that is obtained from the sensors and so on and so forth. So it would be a platform, a complete platform uh, for communicating and detecting uh, information from the users. So these are some of the building blocks uh, that we, um, uh, we feel would be necessary uh, in these contact lenses. So uh, the contact lens would need to have something like a sensor. It would need to have a power management unit, which would be responsible for uh, harvest, which would be responsible for conditioning the power that's obtained from the energy harvester. Uh, uh, an analog to digital converter would be necessary to convert the analog signals that are obtained from the biosensors to the data transmission block, and so on. Um, uh, so the basic building blocks, as I mentioned, um, uh, are all there in, in a, a typical contact lens platform. In terms of energy harvesting, uh, we did mention that solar energy would be very useful. Uh, it would also be perhaps the best energy harvesting technique um, because of the fact that we can collect uh, a lot of, uh, we can harvest and convert a lot of energy from the sun. However, uh, solar electricity is intermittent, so it would need to be combined with an alternative energy harvesting solution. So we recently proposed a hybrid energy solution that combines both a radio frequency as well as solar energy, and uh, more information can be obtained uh, from a recent publication um, uh, that was just uh, uh, published uh, a few months ago. So in terms of our activities in eye gesture measurement, I'd like to maybe show one uh, video that shows what we have developed in terms of uh, gesture control. So here, this is a concept um, uh, that shows uh, how we can use magnetic sensors for detecting the position of the eye. Um, so the majority of the literature, they use near-infrared cameras, light transmitters, and, uh, and, and cameras for detecting the position of the iris. Uh, these solutions are very expensive. So for example, um, uh, I'm sure you're aware of the Toby eye tracker, which is available on the market. So this is an eye tracker that sells for around 20,000 pounds. There are cheaper versions, such as, for example, the pupil core. So this costs around 2,000 pounds, but it is less accurate. Um, so what we tried to develop is a very simple eye tracker that's based on these contact lenses. Uh, so these are based on, as I mentioned, uh, TMR sensors. Uh, if I may, if I can show you a quick video that demonstrates, so this is a two-minute video that demonstrates the concept. <laughs> Spintronic sensors for wireless eye movement gesture control. This proof of concept aims to use spintronic tunneling magnetoresistive sensors to detect the magnetic field from the variable contact lens. The application of such a system can be for wheelchair control by using the eye as a controller. In this video, an eye gesture based game is played to test the robotic eye model. Our first step is to have a participant's eye movement recorded from a web camera and in real time controlling the robotic eye model. The eye model contains a magnet and the magnetic field is detected by the TMR sensor. Three TMR sensors represent the gesture direction from the magnetic field of the gesturing eye model and using this system, the Tetris game can be played. The TMR sensor is a magnetic sensor that has different resistance values depending on the field strength and in-plane magnetic field direction. 
We have low resistance when the in-plane field is parallel to the pin layer and high when anti-parallel. This allows us to determine the gesture direction and proximity of the eye model to the sensor. Since three TMR sensors represent the gesture direction of the eye model, to move the block to the right, gesture the eye to the right corner. For a left block movement, gesture left, and to bring down a block, gesture up. The aim of the game is to get four blocks in a row. The participant is playing the Tetris game by moving the robotic eye model, which is controlled by the web camera. In this close-up of the screen, the person is looking directly at the Tetris game and the webcam is 70 centimeters from the eye. Using the graphical interface, the commands are sent to the eye model and the signal is received from the TMR sensor to control the game. Thank you for watching. This work has been presented by MeLab. So, um, uh, so that basic video shows uh, how we could use uh, these sensors for um, uh, these sensors for monitoring the position of the eye. And here we used a readout circuit for conditioning uh, and con conditioning and amplifying the signals that were obtained. Uh, we also used a bit of uh, artificial intelligence for classifying and for determining what kind of gesture that was 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 obtained. Uh, I, I understand that time is running out, Zubair. So just very quickly, I'll wrap up by also mentioning that we tried to demonstrate, we also demonstrated the fabrication of contact of, uh, of antennas on uh, contact lenses. And over here, in a recent publication, we demonstrated how this antenna can be effectively fabricated on a contact lens. And this antenna works without any uh, external power. Uh, so it achieved a bandwidth of around 0.7 gigahertz. And this is our first step in demonstrating that lenses can be used for uh, energy harvesting applications. So in conclusion, smart contact lenses can be used for a variety of applications, medical, display, safety, and security, as well as uh, gesture control. I don't think it will be very far away that we will be able to realize something that looks like this, where we are able to uh, uh, interact with contact lenses and uh, uh, display information, as well as harvest energy from uh, the surroundings as well. So these are some of our recent publications in this area. We've only started working in this area for the past uh, one and a half years. If you are interested in getting in touch or if you are interested in learning more about this work or in collaborating with us, please do get in touch. Thank you very much and my apologies if I went over. Thanks Rami, that was really, really interesting. Um, so yeah, Open up the questions to the floor. Can I just read one from the from the message? Because I think this is a really good question from Aya. She says, uh, is there any possibility to induce, obviously to, to use biodegradable drug carriers in these lenses, but then would it be possible to, to put in an, an, an impulse in there, a stimulus where you use your eye to stimulate drug release? Yes. The short answer is yes. We are. So that is... Um, that is what we would like to do. We haven't demonstrated that yet, but we have actually proposed something similar to the EU. We weren't successful in getting the funding, but yes, uh, the idea is to be able to make the contact lens smart enough to understand our gestures. And hopefully by making a gesture, we'd be able to release a drug or for example, to interact with an alternative device or you know, to send some kind of a signal. Yes. Now, how could this can be realized? One of the ideas is for example, to use solar cells. Uh, so, for so as you know, solar cells they work by um, uh, um, converting light into electricity. So, if you blink, you will moment momentarily block uh, the passage of light into your eye. So, the uh, cell would interpret that as um, uh, no light, zero light. So, depending on the duration of which you have blinked, so that could be a gesture. So, yes, in theory. If that is possible. We are working on demonstrating that. Thank you for that question. Yeah. Thank you. Presumably, your the the blinking you can use that as one of your mechanical cues to power up the 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 battery that you have. Could you convert that mechanical blinking gesture into a into power? Because of the pressure. Yeah. Maybe. Maybe. Maybe that is possible. Yeah, we could uh, so perhaps using piezoelectric materials. Maybe. 
I, I think one of the best things about these contact lenses is even you can incorporate drugs in there, but you've got an antenna so you can communicate with the outside world. Things like glaucoma, I think it will be really important to monitor pressure. You could do monitoring pressures, you know, over the day, for example, using these contact lenses, and they can send information to um, to a, a third party. And the, the great thing is now there is this field called SWIPT, so simultaneous wireless and information power transfer. So with these antennas, now it's becoming more and more possible to both transmit information mm -hmm. and and to convert uh, radio frequency waves into useful electricity. Now with the advent of 5G and 6G, more and more devices are connected to the internet and all these devices, they emit radio frequency waves. Yeah. So it is now becoming a possibility, a reality to be able to do both things at the same time. And to do both things on a contact lens is something yeah. very interesting. I mean, the future is bright, isn't it? Especially because everything is miniaturizing. And so the potential of the, of the contact lens to use it as both a diagnostic, but also to deliver stuff is, is, is I think it's, it's really useful, especially the, the stuff that we're talking about, we're talking about long-term diseases. So the opportunity to deliver something for a long period of time is something that, you know, contact lenses could overcome. Yes. Uh, and I guess potentially also the opportunity to deliver something properly on demand. Mm. So um, if you've got physiologic monitoring there as well, um, you, you could mitigate spikes in IOP, for instance, by treating the spike in IOP when it, when it arose. Yeah, the possibilities are endless. So, for example, again, if you have people, elderly people, uh, um, so uh, uh, how can you monitor the? How can you monitor elderly people wirelessly and remotely? Uh, how can you inform them, alert them to take certain drugs or a certain medication? So, so yes. So, in theory, that that is great. Uh, whether we can realize that or not, this is what we are working towards. Any other questions from anyone else? Larry, go for it. Can't hear you, Larry. <laughs> okay. Will you also enable posterior eye delivery using small pulses? Could you use the contact lenses to deliver something to the back of the eye? At the back of the eye. Yeah. So to the back of the eye. Yeah. So there are at the moment, there is work on retinal implants. Mm -hmm. Yeah, retinal implants. I'm not sure whether this is possible using a contact lens. I'm yeah. I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. Something that we could we could we could uh, have a look at. Mm. Okay, I'll just wait to see if Larry's back and then. Larry, yeah. Larry, 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 yeah, it's just it doesn't like being on mute, you know. Once you go <laughs> unmute, it keeps yeah. No, no, really interesting talk, and and this kind of ties into what Richard was saying that that kind of monitoring. If you've got uh, when it's met monitoring biomarkers as well, or different, let's say inflammation markers, then that could trigger the release of of certain drugs as well. Just you kind of have that internal kind of feedback loop. Yeah, no, it's a, that, that, that really just really interesting talk. Like you say, the the future. Is bright to bear, you know, mm -hmm. there's a lot of potential there for what we could do with it, um, you know, every aspect of it. So, really great talk. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Randy. I'll, I'll, I'll call the discussions on your talk to, to a conclusion there. Thanks very much for joining us.